Aloha and welcome to Bittersweet News. I'm your host, Carol Cox, and thank you for joining me. We're going to be talking about uh, shark finning in Hawaii. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, uh, many of you out there, uh, how uh, big of a role Hawaii played in the uh, shark finning industry. It was quite substantial. Uh, as far back as 1990, uh, we were able to document, personally document, the uh, number of sharks uh, that were coming in and the types of, and the sources that were they were coming in by. And, um, you know, some out there may ask, why care about a shark? Shark eat people. Shark bite people. They injure people. Of course they do. Uh, they are predators. They are the apex predator, or one of the apex predators in the ocean. And uh, if we tolerate the practice of shark finning, uh, then we tolerate the pretty much upset and disturbance of nature and the ecosystem as we know it in the ocean. And uh, how it might affect other things, we don't really know the full detail, but what magnitude. But you know, shark finning presents a number of problems. Uh, this is not a practice where the shark is being caught by fishing boats and in turn the entire shark is taken and processed for food and what have you. This is a process where the fins are taken off. The dorsal fin, the sexual fin, the pectoral fin, the tail, and all of that are taken. And then the body is discarded. And on many occasions, these sharks are alive. So just imagine what uh, this presents. And you, throughout this show, you're going to see a number of photographs that I've taken over the years that uh, document and reflect what really transpired and took place behind the scenes here in Hawaii. So with the passage originally of the law in Hawaii prohibiting shark fins or shark finning and shark fins being landed in the state of Hawaii, that was an effort put together by a number of people and to include myself and my organization Enviro Watch to look for and ferret out and prevent the practice of shark finning. Now mind you, shark finning was encouraged by the state it was tolerated by the state. It was encouraged by the National Marine Fisheries Service. It was encouraged and tolerated by the Western Pacific Fisheries Council. And in fact, they did a pamphlet suggesting that shark finning was actually a practice of the, quote, native Hawaiian. That was a scale. And then they also said that to justify this, they said, well, the practice of shark finning is done by a few people aboard vessels and it's just used for beer money. While we know that that is not true because we were able to recover documents that sh clearly showed that these species, the various species of shark, were reported to the National Marine Fisheries Service reflecting the tonnage, the species, the amount per pound or kilo. And we have those records, actually, and we're not going to show them tonight, but this is one facility. And you see these bales that are floating. So uh, the bales that you see there, this is aboard the vessel Chris. You saw a picture earlier. And this vessel would go out, out to sea and collect six, seven, eight, eleven tons approximately in these bales and bring them back. It was a long line of boat, but it was actually being used to meet the mothership, so to speak. And how that was working is that smaller ships would navigate the oceans and in the Pacific and throughout, and then they would in turn meet the mothership and exchange the shark fins, the dry shark fin and the bill shark fin for goods and, and offload. And then the mothership would come near shore here in Honolulu and then offload. Well, this particular load here, what you see here, came in on the two star. And the two star originally, it was reported customs and the Coast Guard thought they had a drug deal 
uh, that they were wanting to bust. But when they boarded the vessel, they found that it was loaded with shark fin. And the shark fin had actually gotten wet. And if you've ever smelled ammonia in its strongest form, shark fin is the same thing. Very strong, the, the urine or the, from the uh, shark fin uh, have a horrendous smell. So that's one way the shark fins were coming in. These, again, these were taken off of the two star and they were brought in offloaded. At that time, it was Pure 38 wasn't around. So this was down in that area, Ka'ava Street. And was on the, they were brought off. They found no violation per se, and they allowed them to put this. We found this shark on the beach out in Waianae where someone had removed the shark fin, the shark's fin. Now, sharks also came in in another form. The fin itself was taken off and frozen, fresh, and we would see three, four ton at a time come in, and uh, RC International was one of the companies, and that company would bring them in and then thaw them out, offload them, and it had a crew, the company had a crew, and they would grade the shark fin, trim the shark fin, because what you're looking for is a cartilage to make soup. And then that, that shark fin would then be graded, bundled up, and shipped to China, and also San Francisco, and other places. And in turn, would return for process, they would return some processed shark fin, and the Royal Chinese Cafe, it was one of those, this Royal or RCI. Uh, anyway, this was when shark fin was legal to sell the soup, and now here in Hawaii, you can't buy it. You shouldn't be able to buy it now by law. But again, it, this is, now if you look at that bale, now imagine six ton of shark fin, and the one shark gives off, we'll say the largest shark, maybe, I'm going to guess at the time, depending on if they're wet or dry, between five and eight pounds dry. So six ton of shark fin, how many sharks does that represent? Well, you can decimate the population of sharks. And in Marshall Islands and the Marjoro and those areas, the shark fin industry focused on that area. And as you know, if you're familiar with some of the National Geographic uh, shows and nature shows, you've probably heard about the big bank where the sharks go there in the, that area in the Marshall Islands. But anyway, you're able to decimate a population and that would offset the stability, make it unstable, the, the environment. And so where the shark would normally be the predator, you have nothing to serve as a predator that in that capacity that the shark was serving it because you've diminished its numbers. And also it poses a threat to the shark, the population of the shark itself, a certain species. And so blue shark, mako shark, uh, Galapagos shark, any kind of shark, uh, they would take them. And each shark brought a different price, mind you. Um, so what happens is that here in Hawaii, the, this is an actual deal where they were paying off purchasing shark fin. And what you see here, I'm trying to show you now the, you remove the outer skin, you take hot water, this is a process, and you saw this bundle here. This is actually the cartilage that what you're looking for to make the shark fin. This is what the, the sought out, looked like witch's hair or blonde witch's hair and he scraped off all of the outer skin and using hot water and then that bundle is dried and, and they're like fine needles and then this is a process they were grading here and you see in the background there they have tubs and again the people there are offloading it and so what would happen this mothership as I told you 
it would offload out at sea on the Chris or the two star and then it would empty its load and come in because it was unlawful to offload here and and so at Pier 1 and those areas the bigger ships would come in and we actually found some of those ships offloading shark fin right there alongside the dock and then to make matters worse the state agencies really were not not protecting or enforcing the little laws that were in place the National Marine Fishery Service really was conflicted because they couldn't enforce the law because they were actually even though we were giving them information we would give them the information and they would sit on it because they also work with the National Marine Fisheries Service Western Pacific Fisheries Council and the Fisheries Council allowed this and encouraged the actual shark finning because their goal is to enhance fishing of all kinds it doesn't matter now this is uh, the Anna Sea now the Anna Sea is a unique uh, situation the Anna Sea came to town and the Anna Sea sought to sh do shark finning but also fish for shark because you, the shark meat deteriorates uh, f after a few days so it does not have a shelf life per se so this gentleman came to town with the Anna Sea and got a permit issued a special permit which was erroneous and then in turn proceeded to use a short long line not a very long long line but a short one with less line and shallower and proceeded to catch sharks and then his goal was to catch the shark fin as well as the meat well we fought back and that practice was stopped but again if you can just think that you 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 read the papers and you see the, the various shows and you hear it's happening in China but actually it was happening right here at our doorstep right here and what would happen is that whether it was uh, frozen if they were frozen coming from Marshall Island they would in turn come in a frozen container they would be offloaded truck to the area right there on Nimitz Street and then in turn they would be thawed out they would be in small bags and uh, they would be thawed out trimmed with the bandsaw dried and there were humongous and you driving down Nimitz now you can see this huge blue building with this strange vent on top uh, by the shell station uh, by the shell uh, and the, the Paradise Juice Company or one of those juice com sunshine juice companies right there along Nimitz and um, if you look this is a blue building with a strange mm -hmm. vent on the very top in the old days when they were actively processing shark fin you would come through there and you would smell the strong sense you would detect that strong sense of urine similar to ammonia I should say and that was the actual shark finning uh, process that was what was going on and they <clears throat> excuse me and we were actually here in Hawaii playing a critical role in the actual shark finning and decimating the population of sharks throughout the Pacific and in other places around the world sharks were brought in from South America if you can imagine something unchecked there was no limit to what could be caught first of all it was uh, no holes bar no rules it was a playing field open playing field no one really monitoring to say that you can only bring one ton a shark or you could only catch 10 ton per week or there was nothing and mind you some argued that this shark fin was actually the byproduct of a long line fishing but there were some industry people that found it to be more profitable to catch shark and transport them back to China because if you look at the cost of a bowl of shark fin soup it's astronomical 
And so there was, the return was so great, the demand was so great. So it put really a threat on the po or world's population of shark fin. And that's why today we should discourage that. And if you get the opportunity to say no or voice your opinion in, in, in disagreement to anybody or foreign body or our government, that thinks about reopening or tolerating, allowing shark finning, uh, you should take into consideration all of these. I mean, this, is, um, this picture here speaks for itself. Now this is that, uh, that shot there was taken at uh, Fisherman's Wharf. That building is now torn down, but it was right near the old uh, marina uh, shipyard there. And that was the RCI's original. And there were three people, key people, that uh, did shark fins. And they would, uh, Michael Lau was one of them, who I became uh, quite uh, familiar with, and he shared many of stories. And he said that he actually went to Samoa to buy shark fins down there and actually rode a boat, and he talked about how difficult it was and how hard it was to bounce, and he chuckled and said that, well, but the f other two guys that were involved with him, they would fly in airplanes, and, and their ride was easy, but he was going down there to do some of the bidding and buying and what have you in Samoa, Marshall Island. So uh, this was a big business. And in fact, uh, I'm told through uh, various contacts that Mr. Lau, upon when he passed away, just the remnants of his shark finning business that he had, the remnants that was left were in the thousands of dollars that they were able to sell those, just what was left hanging around the office, so to speak. And, and so when you consider that the Western Pacific Fisheries Council actually sponsored a little pamphlet, as I mentioned earlier, and it showed the character of a native Hawaiian, suggesting it was a native person running with a few shark fin on a string and uh, laying them on thatch roof to dry them and a little rain, and he's trying to keep them out of the rain. But in reality, we were looking at every vessel, practically, here in the Long Line fleet as the, in, the fleet increased, so did the frequency of shark finning. We would see them openly being dried, hung on the boat on top side. And, and then in turn, that was a, a, a real eye opener and, and things began to, I guess people began to see the real magnitude with the various uh, stories and news that's showing the shark finning and what have you. And you, the public, really got it. You understood the significance of uh, th and the importance of stopping this practice. And, and though we don't hear it today, it's not a big news item. There's always a desire and always a threat that someone somewhere will attempt to try and restart the practice of shark finning, even in this state. Uh, the recent case, mind you, that was where one of the, the deckhands or workers aboard the vessel's l local longline fleet was only charged $100. So the penalty should have been stiff, but again, it was just a gratuitous, I uh, will fine you a small amount of money. So we have to be forever watchful if you are interested in protecting uh, marine resources. And uh, it's, it's kind of uh, difficult to say to you, let's protect them. I know when we're seeing now more frequency of shark bites. But I say this to most of you out there, more people eat shark than shark eat people. Now that may sound crazy, but if we're in their environment, more likely we're going to have uh, these interactions. And here recently, uh, there is some new findings that suggesting and explaining why sharks are more frequently biting. 
But again, even if they are biting and attacking people, it does not justify the reckless and wanting, wanton slaughter and uncontrolled slaughter of sharks. It just simply does not rise to that occasion. There's no justification for it. We don't have the right, as, as human beings, do not have the right, in my opinion, to kill and maim. And I, I don't f want to go as far as saying, how would you like to have your limbs uh, and legs cut off and then leave you sitting on the bus stop and see if you can fend for yourself? You couldn't do it. So why would we do that and expect a shark? They don't grow them back, their fins. They don't grow them back. They're cartilaginous, and so therefore, they're done. And if you've seen a picture, or if you've seen anything remotely that comes close to this, it will leave a definite impression on you that this is wrong, it's a cruel practice, and it's wasteful. And if we were to manage our resources in the ocean, managing it would be first managing our apex species. And only certain people get to eat it, but certain people get to make a big profit from it. But that should not be the reason we ban shark finning. Not for the economics of it, but the ecology of it. And it's so important that we do this. It's so important that we look at sharks as being playing an important role in the food chain, an important role in the ecosystem, and they must be there because you could have an explosion of certain species that were being checked by sharks. It could be leading to many of things of preventing explosions, dolphins, marine mammals, or what have you. So there's a, a real fragile situation here, and hopefully we see the population of sharks increase now as a result of this. But we don't know. They no longer offload them here. And, and in fact, it's possible that they are offloading them. But we have a practice here now where everything, everything along our ports is locked down in the interest of security. So in the old days, all of these pictures, I was able to go in at midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning, any time of the day and go in and document the presence of these shark fin, document the activities, the, the nefarious activities that surround them, the sneaking them in. And one occasion, the U.S. Customs off the Chris had Chris offloaded the shark fins, placed them on a container, drove them maybe less than a half a block away, parked it, they popped the seal and offloaded them there. Now, in theory, it was supposed to be uh, an, an area that you could not. It was only to be transported out and through, transshipment. But for some reason, at that time, the U.S. Customs allowed them to have a ban, and we have photographs of all of that and documented it, put a ban on this, seal it, and take it less than a block away and then park it and open it again. It was all for show and, and, and when we found that, uh, so this just tells you the importance of uh, shark finning, of what the various agencies thought about it. It was, it was something in the making and it was a very difficult effort to try and get the legislators to actually pass this law and, and understand. But with public support and the many letters and phone calls and, and various shows and things of that nature, it helped in the news stories. The people got it. And so we m must be mindful and watchful of this practice. Now this was at Kewalo Basins, by the way, Mr. Michael Lau's place at the time. And this is what he would purchase from uh, various long line boats. The boats would come in and he would in turn sell them. This is coming from the mothership here. You see uh, how professionally uh, packaged they are in bales and, and this was, and you never wanted them to get wet. 
these are wet. This is on the two star, this shot here. And you don't want that. Again, you see here, this is shark fins uh, at Michael Lyle's place. But there were at Fishman's Wharf, along Nimitz Highway, and also you could buy shark fin along the, from the longline boats at Key Wallow Basin. So those were the three main areas that you, you would see. And right there next to the NOAA office, there's a small building there where it still stands. Uh, it may be refurbished now, but that was where the shark fin industry started right there in a sense with Michael Lowell, the gentleman from RC International, and Mr. Uh, uh, can't think of the last name right now, but uh, you. So again, all of this, and I, I share this with you because it's many people ask, well, what about shark finning? And we didn't get that many in Hawaii. Well, yes, we did, as I've hopefully shared with you, that shark finning was so prevalent and prominent here, and it was done in the open. It was not done on the cover other than uh, getting them in, and, and that even in itself was still in, done in an open sense because you could see it. They, they didn't hide it because we didn't have any laws at the time, per se, and we didn't have any enforcement and no declarations required or necessary in the early stages. But then as time went on and we began to appreciate what it threats it posed to depleting the population and the threat it posed to offsetting the ecology of our oceans, then with the world body crying out, prohibiting shark finning and frowning on the practice of shark finning, then we start to see a change. So right here on these shores, shark finning was alive and well. But with our effort, concerted efforts, we actually took a bite out of that, that practice. We said to many of the agencies, you must do something. We said to the state, you must do something. The state sent out letters notifying most of the fishermen here that they could not shark fin but they failed to have a return receipt, proof of receipt or anything. So we raised our voices and changed that practice. And so today, we hope that this practice will go away permanently and we will not see this practice. Thank you for joining me on Bittersweet News. I'm your host, Carol Cox. Thank you.